Thank you so much. Okay, we're gonna get started now. Okay, good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, I am honored and uh, myself as well as Dean Hunter, um, we both um, wanted to you know, bring in experts and expertise in our field, um, just to show you, you know, those individuals who are out there dedicated to our field. So we are honored to introduce our esteemed guest to, for today, Mr. Joseph Haynes Davis. And as an assistant professor of social work, I am particularly excited to introduce someone who has dedicated their field, uh, their career to a field that is my profession and also my passion. So as we prepare to listen to his insight and wisdom, I urge you to keep in mind the immense relevance of his work to our field. It's not just about knowledge, but about making a real difference in the lives of those we serve in our communities. So without further ado, let us warmly welcome Joseph Haynes Davis and get ready to be inspired by his expertise and dedication to social work, racial and educational equity, law and leadership. So Mr. Joseph Haynes Davis. All right, well, good morning. I mean, that's a great introduction. Uh, I, uh, I see you, uh, Honorable Professor. I can't uh, really see the audience. Um, I don't know how many folks. How many folks do we have in the room? Approximately. Somebody, somebody going to answer? Huh? There are fifteen individuals here altogether. Okay. All right. Okay. So. Good morning to everyone. Uh, it's my understanding that uh, you all are uh, undergrads. Uh, it's my understanding that the uh, majority of you uh, are possibly uh, freshmen and uh, maybe not, but I'm trying to recall what uh, Professor Janice uh, told me uh, about uh, your class and about uh, uh, you all, there we go, you all as an audience. Uh, but at any rate, uh, it's my pleasure and my honor uh, to be here this morning. I'll give you a little background uh, on me. Um, I uh, have a, a bachelor's degree in uh, communication journalism from Illinois State University. Now my master's degree is from the University of Pennsylvania, master's degree in social work and MSW. I got that in 1992. My undergraduate degree I got in 1991, I'm sorry, 1981. And uh, my Juris Doctor, my law degree, I received in 1996 from Rutgers Law School, Camden. And while I was doing all of this, I was working in broadcasting in radio. I'm one of the, uh, I would like to say, and in the words of Muhammad Ali, it isn't bragging if it's the truth, uh, but I'm one of the pioneers in introducing hip hop uh, to uh, popular radio uh, back in uh, beginning in 19, uh, 84 uh, in Philadelphia and Power 99 in Philadelphia. Now, you might ask, well, what does that have to do with social work? Well, uh, social work is a field of learning, and it is a field of activity that is a broad horizon. Unlike some situations, some professionals, some educators, and I'm clearly not implying the good folks at Florida Memorial University uh, are implicating the good folks at Florida Memorial University because that's the reason why they have me here this morning. But some people uh, and some educators in some institutions suggest that the field of social work is limited 
to social work. In other words, that it is limited, whether it be clinical social work or active uh, advocacy or medical hospital social work or education social work, that it's limited to the normative view of the field of social work. And I reject that. The field of social work, like other fields, encompasses a broad spectrum of uh, not only education, but professional self, uh, professional possibilities. And I am a prime example of that. For instance, while I was the number one broadcast air personality in Philadelphia, again, I successfully matriculated at the University of Pennsylvania School of Social Work. And one of the reasons why I did it is because A, they accepted me, but B, the fact of the matter is when you are dealing with captive audiences and particular communities, which this radio station did, playing R&B and hip hop, taking it to the next level ensures infinite possibilities for learning, for image development, for cognitive development, not only for your captive audience and your community, but also for yourself. The integration of communication and journalism with the field of social work is paramount. Because when you think about it right now, what we are experiencing is that very synthesis and integration. That being, we are using a form of communication, a, a form of technology, to broadcast to you knowledge about social work. When you are reading your materials, whether they be books or whatever you all use now in the digital age, it's a synthesis of your knowledge of social work, the social work framework, and also technology, communication, and I would submit to you, journalism, publishing, and the like. So I come here to you this morning to speak to you about while you are matriculating in a field called social work, the subsequent possibilities and even possibilities while you are matriculating are infinite. Do not limit your knowledge base to just the field of social work. Another example, for my thesis at the University of Pennsylvania, not only did I write the normative thesis paper for my master's, but I also produced a documentary on the uh, client body of Black American male juvenile delinquents and juvenile delinquency uh, in the Philadelphia area. And it was done at uh, something then called uh, uh, the Ben Salem. It was a Ben Salem institution for uh, black male juvenile delinquents that were convicted of powerful crimes and were serving time in a juvenile institution. And so it was my theory that not only uh, was it the juvenile convictions, but the process that they were going through was a struggle for manhood, I'm sorry, manhood and identity here in America, which one could argue, again, was part of that process. 
So I went in with a high eight video camera, interviewed some of the client population on the issues, produced it, did the narration, applied my bibliography, which I looked for to try to uh, give to Dr. Janice so she could hand it out to you all, but I, I couldn't find it. But at any rate, apply the knowledge base and come up with a documentary that was produced for the use as a learning tool in educational situations like this and beyond, meaning for undergrad and master's level and even law schools. Well, lo and behold, later on that year, in 1992, when I graduated, the Villanova University Law School requested my documentary to uh, be a supplement to the juvenile law clinic at the Villanova University Law School. And that was very, very fulfilling for me as I, at the time, was entering into law school at Rutgers Camden. And you think about what I'm talking about. You produce this documentary along with your paper for your degree, for the purpose of educating others. And lo and behold, a prestigious in institution, a prestigious educational institution like Villanova Law School used my thesis documentary for the purpose for which it was designed. And that was very, very powerful for a young black American like myself who was pushing the envelope. And let me add that it was the first time it had ever happened at the University of Pennsylvania. And let me also add that there was some tension in the fact that I was doing it. Why would there be tension in the fact that a matriculating master's student was producing a documentary along with the requisite paper for his degree? Well, it was because you were pushing the envelope outside the normative scope of what is required in institutions, in the world of academia, et cetera. So I urge you all as students not to put in jeopardy your learning and your successful matriculation from uh, Florida Memorial University, but think about the things that can be done that aren't normally done in this world of education. Think about uh, uh, availing yourself to learning curiosity, the curiosity of learning, because learning is learning but to exceed expectations, you have to be curious. And I've done that my whole life, my whole career. As a matriculating, again, uh, graduate, master's student, I went on to law school. People didn't know why I would go, wanted to go to law school. I said, why not? It's more learning. As a journalism communication major, undergrad, and the number one air personality, hip hop R&B DJ in Philadelphia, number one, number one in the ratings throughout the 80s and early 90s. Why would you want to go to graduate school? Well, why not? Why wouldn't I want to do that? Why wouldn't I want to expand my knowledge? to the community that I'm serving. Back in the 80s, there was a presumption in some academic areas 
that black American men had to wear a number of hats to help uplift our community. Being a role model, being an image that some of our community had never understood or would ever imagine. I was that. And the only reason why I was that is because I thought about it. I could envision it. I connected the dots because learning is infinite. Learning has no borders. Education and knowledge has no borders. Let's move up to now. I've been practicing law since 2001 here in Orlando. And on the way, I launched a radio station in Dallas, Texas, KRNB. It's still the dominant black radio station on the FM dial in Dallas, Texas. I come to Orlando, I finally pass the bar, start practicing law, run a title company in real estate. I've been a value adjustment board attorney special magistrate in this state for over 40% of the counties, meaning having been appointed. I ran for judge twice. I'm currently running for supervisor of elections of Orange County, Florida, as we speak. Since 2020, I was the legal, political, and social policy analyst for TRT World Broadcasting, broadcasting to over 260 million English-speaking viewers around the globe. You might ask, what is TRT World Broadcasting? It is the public radio station for Turkish public broadcasting. That is correct. The country of Turkey broadcasting from Istanbul around the world. Why would I do that? Is because they sought me because of my work, because of my reputation, and because of what I believe was a solid knowledge base with which to work from along the way. I don't know how old you all are, but you might remember the Trayvon Martin matter back in 2012. I was one of the analysts on CNN, I'm sorry, on MSNBC and Al Jazeera covering that. And I was one of the journalists for Ebony.com on the Zimmerman Trayvon Martin matter. You might remember another matter, and I don't know if you do. The Jordan, uh, the young man, uh, oh, I remember his name is Jordan. His mother is now a uh, United States congressional representative in Atlanta. But this was the loud music trial, uh, loud music shooting trial. I was one of the analysts for that. That was on CNN, Anderson Cooper. So I tell you this story and I tell you this, these things because you all, as young matriculating folks at the prestigious Florida Memorial University, you have bound, a boundless, infinite possibilities in your career. Have a plan. Yes, get your degree. And yes, look for a job and maybe go to graduate school, but do not limit the knowledge possibilities. Look into taking some journalism classes, business classes, broadcast classes, law, because law is applicable to every endeavor here in America, especially for folks like you as well 
as communication and journalism classes and knowledge and understanding. You all have been blessed with having technology, this type of instant technology as part of your world since you've been born. Use it to learn and to advocate and think again in boundless ways, no borders. Challenge the current knowledge base. My, my bibliography for graduating with my master's degree, again, challenged the University of Pennsylvania. The University of Pennsylvania is one of the Ivy League schools. So you have all these quote unquote Ivy League traditions that I challenged because if this is about learning, learning is reciprocal. In other words, the instructors themselves, the professors themselves, the institution itself was learning from me because hip hop was a new genre, a new lifestyle in our community. They didn't know diddly about it. I would show up dressed like this for class, looking good as I do, but at night or in the afternoon, I'd be playing Eric B and Rakim, Public Enemy, Run DMC, and the like. Queen Latifah, who used to come on my show. Pushing the envelope, not settling for the status quo. I had a person who I worked with who was a supervisor over me in broadcasting in Philadelphia. And I can say this, he sometimes made it difficult. I was the number one air personality. He made it difficult because I was going to school. Lo and behold, this person goes back to school himself and now is a distinguished PhD in education. So I'm not going to take credit for his matriculation, but I will take credit on the influence that I had on him and others. I have another colleague in broadcasting. I encouraged her to go to law school because I was going to law school. So you can make things happen just by your use and sense of self. Intellectual curiosity is the most powerful thing that you possess as a human being, your mind. And you need to continue to grow your mind at all times. Now, you can sit in this class today and you say to yourself, Dr. Janice brought in some guy from Orlando, Joe Davis, Joseph Haynes Davis, some guy I don't, I can't remember. And we sat through, we listened to him. You know, but I'm getting ready to go do something else or whatever. And that's fine. But I guarantee you there will come a day when this lecture here will have an impact on your cognitive growth and development. And that does not mean that I am a perfect person. And Lord knows. I am far from pious and I'm far from perfect. But I look at learning 
And I look at the opportunity that good folks like yourself have in matriculating in programs like this. I don't care if it's Ivy League or not. This is a prestigious HBCU. You have opportunities that the Ivy Leaguers don't have. Excuse me. It's sugar-free Gatorade. You don't know anything about that yet. You have history there at your university that they don't have. Maximize what you have. Your students at Florida Memorial University in the program that you are in, you have an opportunity to do and be anything that you can imagine to be. And let me also say this to you. I don't want to sound like a minister, a preacher, or someone who is yelling at you, because I'm not trying to yell at you. But Dr. Janice brought me here this morning because of the passion that I have for people like you, like us. I'm 64 years old, and I'll be damned if I ever stop until God calls me home. I will push this envelope forever. Knowledge doesn't end. There's an old saying, seeking knowledge from the cradle to the grave. That's what I do. My mother and father did it. My father. My father got his bachelor's degree from an HBCU called Arkansas Baptist College in 1919. It's over 100 years ago. It was during a time when this Supreme Court case called Plessy v. Ferguson was the law of the land. Why is that important? That was the legal precedent that made separate and equal the law of the land. That was before Brown v. Board of Education. It was Plessy v. Ferguson. We commonly know that time as Jim Crow, but he got his bachelor's degree in 1919 when some Americans, forefathers, were coming off the boat at Ellis Island. And we were coming out of the fields of bondage. We were the progeny of reconstruction, which happened after the Civil War, which ended slavery. And the 13th Amendment ratified and passed December 6th of 1865, the 13th Amendment, which outlawed slavery. My father, after getting his bachelor's degree, went on to get his dental license I'm sorry, his dental surgery degree from Northwestern University 
And as I understand it, he became one of the first four black American dental surgeons in the nation. He received his dental degree in May of 1924 and got his license in October of that year, 1924. His name was Dr. Miles Dewey Davis. My mother, the late Josephine Haynes Davis, who I apparently am named after, graduated from an HBCU. In 1938, Kentucky State University, Frankfurt, she was only the third summa cum laude graduate at the university, the first woman summa cum laude graduate at Kentucky State University, went on to get her master's degree from an Ivy League institution called Columbia University in 1941, 10 days after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, which started the entry of this nation into World War II. Subsequent to that, my father received three Medal of Honor citations, two from Franklin Roosevelt, one from Harry S. Truman, both former presidents of the United States, because he, my father, gave the dental exams to the Black American troops going to war for this nation in World War II in the St. Louis area for free. That was during Plessy v. Ferguson, the law of the land, also known as Jim Crow, during segregation. My mother subsequently, in 1953, became the first Black American and the first woman to become a principal in the Madison County School District in Madison County, Illinois, in a place called Lovejoy, Brooklyn in 1953, a full year before Brown v. Board of Education. And I was born in 1959. And I would ask you all to write down and make this note, the November issue of Ebony Magazine November 22nd, 1959 issue of Ebony Magazine tells the story of my parents beginning at page 75. You can find it on Google Books. And on page 78, you will see them holding me as an infant. Now, I tell you all this, not only for my history and background, but to let you know that education is and has been the key to success for us, along with entrepreneurship that you see now in the current situation, in the current life, in the current times we live. You have many people who have become entrepreneurs without education, but everybody can't do that. And I would submit to you that it has been that route that I have taken, that my mother and father took, that you all are taking, that Dr. Janice is taking, and the good people at the university, is the best way to ensure success, knowledge, and so forth, and to pass it on to your offspring. Now, I'm going to stop for a minute to see if Dr. Janice wants to query me with any questions, or if you all have questions, or we can 
do whatever we do with this type of lecture. Thank you, Joe, for um, presenting to our fabulous FMU students here. Um, they do have questions. Um, who wants to think, start with a question? Please stand up and ask Joe your question. I'll start with the question, Joe. Um, All right, now let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. Dr. Questions. Janice. Yes. Yeah. All right. When they ask the question, they ask them to come up here to the to the uh, video, to the camera, so I can see them and hear them. But I want to see you. Because let me also say this to you. If you ever choose to go to law school, the way I learned, when you speak and talk publicly, you stand up. You stand up and speak. And you stand up and make sure people can hear you and see you. Because that's the most powerful image. That is, again, your use of self, respectfully. But go right ahead. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, just wanted to ask, but you pretty much kind of shared that. But I wanted to know, like, what communication strategies have you found uh, valuable in like advocating for change, uh, you know, in your in the field of law, as well in the field of social work as well? Well, I, I would say it's the use of self. That's what we learn in the school of social work from my professor, a black American, meaning my professor that oversaw my thesis, uh, Professor Lewis Carter. It's the use of self. Understanding inflection. When you speak, and speak with power and dignity and effectiveness, and also learning how to write learning how to write effectively and persuasively. Because if you are advocating a position, you have to write persuasively, you have to cite knowledge precedent. Like if you're looking in the Journal of Black Psychology or the Journal of Social Work, these academic journals, you have to correctly cite to that. Or if you're citing the legal precedent, or if you are citing to a published news article, it's something called attribution. You have to use that to advance your argument. So you have to develop good and clear oratory skills. And you have to develop good and clear writing skills and your presence on electronic media has to be thorough, professional, and valid and reasonable sometimes. So I believe that that's the most effective. And I think that, again, not limiting your knowledge base because <clears throat> Excuse me. If you know a lot of things, <clears throat> excuse me, it's a strong likelihood that you will know more than the next person if you know about a lot of things and you're able to verify it. So that's my answer. Okay. Okay, we have another question. Can you see us? No? Yeah, yeah. Have the young man come up here to the, all the way up here to the camera so I can see him. Okay, and also too, there's um, the student who said he she's attended your dad's HBCU. I can tell. No, there's a which one? It's an elementary school in East St. Louis called Miles Davis Elementary. Yeah, that that's uh well. It was, they closed it down, but uh, that was my late half brother. We have the same father, Dr. Miles Dewey Davis. 
Now to the brother who is standing in front of us, brother, can you step to the right? Step to the right a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. Now step down. See, you come, come down. Oh, there we go. Right there. All right. Thank you. Because now I can see you. How you doing? Hello, my name is Antoine Davis. I'm a junior and uh, I major in social work. And I wanted to ask, uh, as a leader in social work, what role do mentorship and collaboration play in your career and how can students benefit from such relationships in their social work journey? Well, that's a good question and thank you for your question. It, it goes back to what I was saying, brother. Learning is reciprocal. So let's just assume, because I guess I am in this instant moment, I'm a mentor for you. Learning isn't just one way. So I can teach you and tell you some things. I can give you the background. I can give you examples. I can give you a bibliography. I can talk to you about folks like Dr. Jawanza Kachufu, Dr. Naeem Akbar, who was the Black American director of the Department of Psych uh, Psychology at Florida State University, whose books and information I used in my bibliography. I could tell you about him, but you would have to go seek it. But once you seek that knowledge and once you read it and understand it and apply it and ingest it, I'm going to learn from you because you're a young man. I'm going to learn from you as to what's happening now. I'm going to learn from you as to how you're going to apply that because I can have a theory of application, of the knowledge, of the law, of media, of journalism. But you could say, Mr. Davis, I get that. But nowadays, this is the way that's done. And I go, oh, really? Wow, you know, you know, you know what I mean? So, so keep in mind that knowledge is not one way. Knowledge and learning is reciprocal. And sometimes that's tough for certain institutions, not yours, but it's sometimes tough for certain institutions to understand that, whether it is academia or professional institutions. Like I said, I was once told that black radio is not a learning book. While I was matriculating at the University of Pennsylvania. And little did that person know that that fueled me even more because it was an absolutely ridiculous, ignorant, immature statement because Everything is a learning book. If I am communicating on the air, on radio, through audio, it is a learning book. You are learning something. If you are doing nothing but learning the latest, what was that song from Two Chains? Or wh whatever. You're learning something. You see? So I think that that is the key. Don't ever let anybody dismiss the fact that learning is not only infinite, but it's reciprocal. That meaning I learn from you, you learn from me. We have one last question because of the time. So Thank you, brother. Thank you. All right. You can see you right there. 
Yes, ma'am. Take your hood off. What's your name? Daphne. I can't hear you. Daphne Honors. Daphne? Yes. I'm a and what did you say your last name was, ma'am? Honors. Honors? Well, good morning, Ms. Honors. Good morning. I'm to work in the field of social work in the of legal aspects. Say that one more time. How does your work in the field of social work intersect with the legal aspects and what advice do you have for students to bridge the gap between law and social work? Okay. So, again, it's learning. Do not presume that different areas of academia and learning are separate. They're all connected. Okay. Social work has a connection to law. Law has a connection to social work. And sometimes they intersect. They intersect when you have to deal with issues in the law. If somebody's charged with something, for instance, and the basis of the problem may not be a criminal issue, but it may be a cognitive issue. It might be an emotional imbalance issue. Or it might be a, per a perception issue. In other words, it's perceived as a criminal matter. But once the facts come out, it was not. So the simple answer is the connection is based upon thinking and understanding that there is no separation because it's all learning, it's all knowledge. And I would submit to you that communication and journalism and publishing and putting things on paper are also connected to the field of social work. I mean, this is a very easy example you have the questions that you have on what a piece of paper and that piece of paper could have been published and you're reading from that piece of paper a book book publishing is a form of communication and journalism and the book could be one that is presumptively a social work thing or it could be a law book or it could be a book about broadcasting or journalism or life. It could be a biography, a bibliography. You see what I'm saying? So I think that you, good people, matriculating in the program that you are in, should think about thinking about no barriers to learning. I just believe you have to correctly document it and correctly attribute the basis of your arguments and your position on learning and the connection between these knowledge bases. But that's a very good question. And I thank you for... Uh, asking me that this morning. I know it was kind of early, but hey, they got me up early. So I guess if I get up early, y'all got to get up early. Okay. All right. You got another one or are we good? Oh, we're, we're good. Thank you for your time because that's, that's the end of our, our um, professional development session today. Um, we look forward to hopefully seeing you in the future um, and also bring more knowledge to our school. Thank you so much. Yeah, well, no, thank you for having me. And hopefully I wasn't yelling at y'all too loud or too crazy. I get just as passionate as y'all do. <laughs> thank you for having me. Okay, you take care. Thank you again. See you soon. All right. All right.